so excited to be here and I wanted to thank um, I want to, uh, to, to thank uh, the Bexley Library, the best library in the land, led by my friend Ben Heckman and supported by a dedicated group of really warm forever learners. Um, I wanna thank them for honoring me with leading our celebration of a true gem in Bexley's crown. Um, as was said, I'm Lori Ann Feibel, I'm city council member and I'm also chair of Bexley's celebration events team. Um, we celebrate our community by funding, planning, and executing tons of fun for our residents and our Central Ohio neighbors. Um, the month of March is dedicated to the celebration of women. Indeed, yesterday was International Women's Day, and our female majority council celebrated each other last night um, as members of the first female majority council in our community. So pretty exciting, very appropriate um, to continue our celebration of, of March um, by commemorating the 50th anniversary of one of our own, Laurel Lee Schaefer, winning the crown of Miss America 1972, known by her community for her inner beauty, as well as her outer Laura Lee was beloved by Bexley. And I know that by the end of this interview, you all are going to know that she still holds Bexley warmly in her heart. So <laughs> I wanted to start off by, you know, I do indeed love all things Bexley. And so therefore love you already. <laughs> and who would love for you to share with us some of your favorite favorite memories about this community that we all hold so dear? Well, and yes, we do hold it all so dear. I uh, was so fortunate to grow up in Bexley. I was Mom and dad moved to Bexley right before I was born. So uh, the little house on Plymouth Avenue was where I uh, grew up. And uh, when I had become Miss Ohio and then came back as Miss America. Uh, I was still, we were still at on Plymouth Avenue. And uh, as a child, uh, I loved riding my bike and I would uh, go up and down the different streets and uh, enjoy the neighborhood and, and all that Bexley had to offer. Mom and dad actually chose Bexley for all it's community feeling it, 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 although it's in the middle of a, a big city, Columbus, it had kind of a small town feeling and lots of trees. That's the one thing mother <laughs> always said. She loved all the trees. And I, as I was riding my bike as a child, I, I um, would often uh, stop and pick up beautiful leaves and then press them in books or go acorn, pick up the acorns and, and just enjoy the, the community and the beautiful neighborhood. Uh, Bexley Public Library was a big part of my childhood. Uh, mother, although she was uh, a teacher before um, I was born while uh, I was being raised. She was an at-home mother and um, she would, we would walk down to Main Street and uh, I can remember uh, there was a drug story called Wenzes and they had um, a so soda fountain and we would stop and get a milkshake or a cherry phosphate. Oh, these are words that young people aren't even going to know what I'm talking about. <laughs> but uh, we would stop and, and, and walk the uh, main street, stop at a lovely little dress shop called the Colony Shop and, and look and see what pretty fashions were in style for that season. And then walk on down a little further to the Bexley Library of Bex public library. And um, mother would take me into the children's section and say, you pick out a couple of books and we'll take them home and read them. She 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 was very involved in early childhood education and literacy was very important to her. So reading was extremely important. And she read to me every night before I'd go to bed. And then she encouraged, of course, lots of reading on my own. So the library was 
very important, um, as was the whole community. I, I participated um, with a lot of the community activities. In fact, uh, uh, recreational, uh, uh, actually recreation association had um, at one point sponsored some theater in, in the summertime. And I did Bells Are Ringing, took the lead in that one summer. Uh, so it, my, I may be living in Leavenworth, Washington with my husband, Michael, and I love where I live, but my heart will always be in Bexley. It's, it's, it's so sweet to listen to you share those, those memories because those memories could be my children's memories too. The collecting the leaves, how important the library is, how I read to my kids every night. Um, your drugstore is our graders for ice cream now. Oh, so I mean, good. and we are all, and, and, and indeed my kids too have participated in Bexley Rec theater production, uh, you know, events and things. Yes. We still do some of the same things. So you'll be, you'll be happy to know that, that a lot of those traditions, a lot of those traditions continue. I know that um, there were people in your life um, that urged you to use your skills yeah. and, um, and to go forward with an idea of, of, of the pageant. I'd love you to, to touch on some of those individuals who encouraged you. And well, I, yes. yeah, they... I would also like you to tweak on the idea that your mom wasn't so thrilled about the idea. <laughs> so, and I love that. She's a very well, forward-thinking no. feminist for the 19, you know, for the 19, early 1970s. And well, I would love for you to share that. Yeah, you're exactly right, Lorianne. Uh, mother, uh, actually, before she married... She did. She started her master's work at Columbia. Uh, th this is when uh, early childhood education, um, uh, the Montessori and Maria Montessori uh, was uh, promoting uh, the creative classroom. And uh, mother was very involved with that before she even married dad. Uh, and so education to her was paramount. Uh, she was uh, uh, one of the things that both my mother and dad uh, encouraged um, in, in all of us, I, I had older sister Elaine and my older brother Chip and then a younger brother Rick, uh, mother wanted all of us to have a college education uh, and to, to really develop our skills through education and through practical experiences. So as I started um, in the, Columbus or in the Bexley uh, school system, uh, I had some teachers along the way that recognized certain skills and abilities in me, actually at a at fairly young age. Uh, There's a wonderful teacher from my fourth grade teacher, Carolyn Retzloff, who unfortunately just recently uh, passed away, but she, and we've stayed close right up until uh, the end of her life. And uh, she recognized uh, certain abilities in me and encouraged me to pursue um, my acting and my, my music interests. And then as I got into high school, um, uh, I was part of the choir, Bexley High School, and Mr. Mayor Myers uh, was a very big proponent of my taking uh, private vo vocal lessons. And then Mr. Iliopoulos was my drama coach. And he uh, saw and recognized that uh, I had a, an, a, a gift for the creative arts. Um, but I should also back up that I was a part, uh, starting in junior high school, um, I had the wonderful opportunity of being a student with the Columbus Junior Theater, and uh, I believe it's changed the name now. It might be Columbus Theater for Children, but uh, it was a wonderful opportunity where on Saturdays you could be a part of learning all about fine arts uh, from early in the morning. We'd go from nine until five o'clock with a, a lunch break, and I did that starting at age 13. So by the time I got to be a senior at Bexley High, um, uh, 
I pretty much knew that I would be pursuing a theater arts and music career. And uh, Mr. Eliopoulos said, well, you know, um, he knew my mom was a widow. Uh, mom was widowed uh, young. I was 10 years old when my father passed away. And he knew that finances were, um, were tricky. And mom had gone back to, to be a teacher again. And he knew that the amount of money that teachers were making, the salary was going to be challenging to, right. to um, put me through college. Uh, but that Ohio University offered a full four-year scholarship. It, you had to audition for this scholarship, and they gave one to a man and one to a woman once a year. And you were competing wow. against people from all over the country for that one scholarship, but it was a full ride for four years. And um, I had to go down to Athens, Ohio on uh, about four different weekends to, to do different events uh, that audition for this scholarship. Some of it was uh, scenes. I had to bring in monologues, a, a classical monologue, a contemporary monologue. Some of it was improv work. I had to show my theater art skills as far as being able to do costuming, hang whites. I had to really show wow. that I was more than just getting on a stage and mm -hmm. learning lines. And I was really prepared for that. And uh, the, Edie Mae Harrell and Mike Carroll had from Bexley had a big part of helping me get prepared for that. So I had people in the Bexley community that really kind of took me under their wing and, and said, you can do this. And when I was at Ohio University as a freshman, I was approached by my sorority to, com to compete in a local Miss America uh, pageant. That they don't call it pageant anymore. They call it competition, but I still call it a pageant. <laughs> and um, I called mother and I had never done anything like this before. And I, I said, what, you know, what, what do you think? And she said, well, you're on a full four-year scholarship. You have to maintain um, a certain grade point in order to maintain the scholarship, be on Dean's list every quarter. Uh, I'm afraid this might take away from your concentration on why you're at Ohio University. Right. And uh, I'm not really in favor of it. She said, you're, you're there to develop your mind, not your body. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, oh, okay. And then thought of it that way. Um, I, and she said, and besides, I kind of like who you are, and I'm afraid this could change you and make you really self conscious and um, put a lot of emphasis on what's external and not what's internal. And I, I kind of got it, you know, I said, it ah, makes sense. Okay, thank you. Uh, in the meantime, I kind of had dismissed the idea of ever being a part of this pageant experience, but mother, uh, unbeknownst to me, made a phone call to Atlantic City and to the Miss America organization to just find out about them a little bit more about what they're all about and was very impressed that it she found out it's the largest scholarship program in the world for young women. And she really liked that idea that I could <laughs> maybe make some scholarship money uh, by doing what I was there to do anyway. I, she loved the fact that it had a talent competition and, she, and that I would be on stage presenting myself. She thought that would really help in my confidence and how I presented myself uh, publicly on a stage. And so she called me back and she said, you know, if you want to try to do this, uh, I'll be there to support you. And she was, she was there. And uh, I often, um, I, I joke because uh, our first experience, uh, which was Miss Southern Ohio down in Pomeroy, Ohio, was a very tiny little pageant. And uh, I didn't know at the time that I was going to be interviewed and uh so all of a sudden we had had this rehearsal it was one of the it was such a small pageant you basically just showed up the day of the competition with your talent with an evening gown and a swimsuit and I had nothing to wear for the interview other than 
my talent competition <laughs> outfit, my evening gown or my swimsuit. And uh, there was no place, no time to go buy anything, no place to buy anything. This town of about 300 people. And mother at the time was wearing a yellow, bright yellow, almost as bright as, as this, uh, linen tent dress. And, <laughs> and she said, well, you can put this on. At least it's a dress. And I said, well, so I don't funny. have I don't I love have any heels. <laughs> and so I, I, I put on her big yellow tent dress and walked into the interview still wearing my tennis shoes because I had cutoffs and a sweatshirt and tennis shoes on. <laughs> and, and they thought I was a plant. They thought that I was kind of like in the middle of the field of, of uh, candidates. And uh, I walked in and kind of did this voguing, like, uh, can you believe it? And sat down and said, hello, I'm, I'm Laurel Shea. Schaefer, and they were all looking at each other like, what is going on here? <laughs> Back when this was happening, when you went in for an interview, you had on like a St. John knit suit of course. <laughs> and gloves, and some of them wore hats. And here I am in a yellow tent dress and tennis shoes. And, uh, and so I explained what happened. I said, this is my first experience. I didn't know about this. And I said, but as ridiculous as you think I look, you should see my mother out in the hall in my size six. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. And we had a great interview. They got it. I happened to win that night. All right. And, um, and had the lovely experience then of going to, for my first experience at Miss Ohio, I never made top 10, but I had a great experience. And after that uh, competition was over, we're driving back from Sandusky, Ohio, and mother said, well, tell me about how you feel about this experience. She always wanted that feedback. And I said, well, I really learned a lot about myself. And I know what I would do if I went back. I know what I would do differently. And uh, she said, well, that's good. I'm glad this was a positive experience for you. Well, to make a long story a little shorter, my sophomore year, I went back into the, uh, a different local uh, Miss America competition, and I that was for Miss Central Ohio, right in Columbus, and I won that and had the experience of going back to Miss Ohio for a second time. I got into the top 10 that year. Um, my junior year, I went into the Miss Ohio University competition, but I didn't win that year. I was only first runner up. However, the Ohio people said, well, come on up to Sandusky. You're in theater arts and music. Come be a part of our professional entertainment troupe. So I was up there. I wasn't a contestant, but I was entertaining um, for the Miss Ohio pageant. Right. And after that, that pageant had named their new Miss Ohio. A couple of the judges came up and were mixing and mingling with contestants and, and uh, other people and came up to me and said, um, we really enjoyed watching you on stage. Have you ever considered going into one of our pageants? And I, I laughed. I said, I've been here twice before. I've had a great experience at Miss Ohio, but I'm getting ready to go into my senior year now. And once I graduate, I'm back. Laurel, Laurel welcome back. I loved you yeah. sharing about your mom and all those precious memories that you have with her and how healthy of an experience that she has. I think yes. today a and lot of times the pageant get a bad rap for well, that right I, now. I think that's an important thing. Uh, it was funny because at the end of all of these different local and even Miss Ohio competitions, she'd come up to me and she'd say, are we, are we done now? Are we finished yet? <laughs> and uh, I said, uh, not yet, not yet. And at, when I finally uh, won Miss America, she came on stage and congratulated me. And she said, now we're done, right? And I said, mother, we're just getting started. <laughs> <laughs> and I guess that is an awesome segue into what were you just getting started? What, what, you know, um, what, what was, you know, I want to make sure that you share with us the fact that 
you thought Miss America should have a, a mission and, oh, and what yeah. that was like when you introduced it. And then, and then I really want you to share with us, um, what does Miss America do oh. after she, she gets her crown? What, what, what happens well, then? You have, are, those are great questions. And you know, very much, you, you know, you see, Miss America crowned, and then you see her give up the crown. It's like right. what happened in between. And uh, uh, that is a, a very important question. Well, I had already graduated uh, from Ohio University before I became Miss Ohio and, and of course, Miss America. So uh, about two days, uh, right after winning, they take Miss America into New York for a lot of press conferences and pictures and interviews and what have you. And uh, NBC and all of the um, network uh, people and sponsors that was Gillette and Kellogg's and all these big wigs, uh, plus the Miss America organizational people were sitting, uh, having dinner. We were all talking about what the year was going to bring. And uh, I said, I really want to address the fact that uh, the the organization and the young woman that carries the title of Miss America has often been criticized for not being relevant. And I, I really would like to make the title more meaningful uh, as I travel around uh, from state to state to be able to have some talking points, to have some mission that, uh, that is relevant. And uh, up until then, Miss Americas were pretty much told when you go into a press conference and they ask you anything controversial, just to say, I prefer not to answer that, or I don't wanna talk about that. I said, I'm a college graduate. I, um, I was on the debate team. I know how to, I, I know how to research uh, current events. I know how to present an opinion without discrediting an opposing opinion. And I would like the opportunity to speak up uh, when I go into press conferences and, and, and be able to address some things that might be controversial. But more than anything, I would, the Vietnam War was very much, very active at the, in 1971, 72. And I wanted to be able to support our military. I'm not saying to support the Vietnam War, but to support those who were putting their lives on the line. Uh, and to my father was a, a Navy veteran of World War II. I was raised uh, with a certain amount of uh, appreciation and respect for our flag, for our national anthem, for the things that make Americans uh, show their love of their country and appreciate their freedoms. And I wanted to be able to support our military. And I said, I'm going to wear a pewter wristband that's inscribed with the name of a POW or an MIA uh, from the Vietnam War. And when I go on The Tonight Show or uh, Dick Cavett, I was on his show and all these different shows that I was on, I wanna be able to talk about that. I wanna be able to talk about the fact that uh, we need to, to, to support our military uh, and, and let them know that they are appreciated. Um, it took, unfortunately, sometimes 50 years for those veterans from the Vietnam War to really feel that they were welcomed home. They, they were very much discredited. And I did take the last USO show over to um, Vietnam and Thailand before they brought everyone back. In fact, a lot of the military were already being uh, brought back to the United States. Uh, the war was starting to um, uh, end and uh, we were already leaving, a lot of the military were leaving Saigon and getting out of Thailand where mostly that was the Air Force up in Thailand. But you asked what I did during that year, uh, besides promoting my, my mission, which by the way, I'm very proud to say, became a part 
of the competition for Miss America. And that is a very big, they, they eliminated the swimsuit, but they've <laughs> added now what they call the social. Initiative. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And the social uh, initiative uh, is uh, each of the candidates, when they come in, whether it's local, state, or Miss America, um, must present, uh, they do a, a PowerPoint presentation or like what they would do on uh, like TikTok. And uh, they, um, that will be their mission. If they become Miss America, that will be their mission uh, for the year. And I think it's wonderful that that now uh, has emerged and burgeoned into something quite significant. Um, I did actually, uh, you, you asked what I do or what Miss America does. She cuts a lot of ribbons and she's on, in a lot of parades and she attends a lot of festivals. And I can honestly say I was in every single state and uh, I traveled about 150,000 miles in then one year's time. Uh, you, there's no rhyme or reason to the schedule. You could be in Florida one day and, and Minnesota the next. So you had to have clothes for all seasons. Um, everywhere you go, uh, as soon as you get off of a plane, um, you're immediately taken to a room where you meet with press and you're uh, interviewed, at, whether it's television, newspapers, magazines, a lot, lot of, you know, a lot of press. Uh, so you've got to be prepared just to speak ex temporaneously. Uh, and um, many times I'd be at special events. I was a presenter at the Emmy Awards uh, uh, and that was very exciting. And I, a lot of big parades, the Macy's Day Parade and the Rose Bowl and what have you and the Mummer's Day Parade in Philadelphia. Beautiful, beautiful experiences. A lot of festivals and this was wonderful to be able to go into all different places and see what they have to offer. And, and what I came to find out is no matter where you go in America, there is something to be said about that area. It could be something historically of interest, something uh, geographically uh, fascinating or of, of particular interest. Um, and then the people, of course, whether uh, you're in a small uh, village uh, like my, our Leavenworth, or it's a little town of only 2000 people uh, or in the Oval Office of, of the White House. I was with President Nixon on many occasions and uh, um, with celebrities uh, at events. But the thing that I love the most was just the autograph sessions where I was making an appearance somewhere and they set up a table and I would just sit there for hours signing whatever someone put in front of me. It could be an autograph book. It could be a t-shirt. Uh, I signed some really weird things, but uh, <laughs> really working, you were working the room and you loved it. And yeah, I, I was, I was not surprised by your personality that that's something that you would enjoy. Well, here's the interesting part of that. So you never think too much about signing a baseball or this or that. Mm -hmm. But I don't know if it's because it's now been 50 years. All of a sudden, I got an influx of a lot of fan mail recently uh, in the last year. Um, but one of the things that I received was a email from a, a young woman who said, um, I was 10 years old when I met you. And she went into all this detail about just meeting me had inspired her. And she said, I just knew that I could, any, anything I chose to do, I could do. What you taught me was you need training, you need talent and you need tenacity. And she said, I never forgot that. And when I say talent, I don't mean singing or dancing, but we all have talents. It's a matter of recognizing, are we good with numbers? Or, uh, are we uh, scientifically oriented? I mean, where, where do our talents, we all have talents. It's just a matter of recognizing them. And then 
pursuing the training of those talents and then having the patience to know that if we really believe in our talent, that time will play into it. Time will always play into that. And that's where the feeling of tenacity, we have to be patient with ourselves and believe in ourselves enough that we give ourselves time. I think back on that junior year when I didn't win uh, Miss Ohio University to go become to go to the Miss Ohio pageant. Um, I gave it one more year. I, I, it was like, I just needed to know that I would get to the age I am now and look at the Miss America pageant thinking what might've happened had I gone back one more time. So it's important to come full circle with what you feel is your calling for your, for your life and what your personal mission is. Right. right. And I, and I, and I can see that so well in you and, and I, I am certain that you being such a young, young person, being in these situations that you got, you you had a lot of practice. Um, And and so I'm I'm certain that helped you with your um, career in the entertainment field, which I think is very exciting. And you have amazing composure. And I love um, that you were so dedicated to having mission and substance to speak on um, and to share with others your thoughts. And I it's also, important. what I also, yeah. yeah, what I also really love is your t- you talked about a full circle. Mm-hmm. Your mission started with our military. You gained a career then supporting the military. And, well, and, we did. And, now, and and so share with us a yeah. little bit about how that developed and and yeah. how you you seem like you went down two different roads an entertainment oh, I did. road oh i've had i've worn many different hats that's for yes. sure uh, so sure because right after miss america then i did start my professional uh acting career um uh actually there was a, a summer stock producer in Ohio by the name of John Kenley. And uh, as a child, I went to all of their productions in the summer and, oh, would I love to be in one of his productions? Well, right after I was Miss America, he called and he said, would you like to audition for, for, for me? And I said, sure. And I did. And uh, that was um, really exciting because I was chosen to, to do the role of Mary in the librarian and music man with, uh, with John Davidson. And that kind of launched my uh, professional on stage career. Uh, and um, I had 40 plus years on stage and doing television commercials first out of New York and then in Los Angeles. Uh, I did lots and lots of television commercials and uh, some um, episodic. I was uh, a regular for two seasons on Falcon Crest and was a co-starred on uh, or did a guest starring appearance on Three's Company. These are all shows that actually are, you can see still Matlock and Quantum Lee. I was a, I was a Falcon Crest always on <laughs> Saturday nights after the love boat. <laughs> on love boat. Yeah. Uh, get Christy. <laughs> shows that you wouldn't even remember. Uh, yeah. uh, Rockford Files. Oh, that was so much fun. He was so cool. Um, I had a wonderful acting career, 40 plus years in that. And then as I got older and the auditions became less and less, I learned how to be a casting director and started that part of my business. And of course, kept all the time. I was keeping up with uh, things like speaking engagements, motivational, uh, Christian speaking, um, singing. I did a lot of concert work. I traveled doing a whole uh, Gershwin concert to two and a half hours. I was the only vocalist. And uh, that was pretty exciting, too. So um, I've done that. But I had an, a un- and also, I should say, over the years, even though I was involved with my performing career, I always had the ability to go into um, the veteran hospitals uh, and visit with with veterans. And um, I got into uh, my early 60s and I had a unique experience with uh, 
Department of Defense had an opportunity for an educator uh, uh, to educate and inspire kind of like personal coaching uh, for our military who had come back from deployments with brain injuries, traumatic brain injuries. And it was a real right angle. I packed up my Los Angeles home. I just literally moved to North Carolina to work at Camp Lejeune, which is a naval uh, base, a Marine and Navy. I worked at the Naval Hospital there and uh, became a certified brain injury specialist along the way. But I worked uh, in a group situation with our, our, um, our service members, these were active duty now, and uh, as well as their families. My, this brought in the wives and many times. And uh, did this uh, through what they call DIVBIC, which is the Defense and Veterans Brain Injury Center. Uh, they're, they're across the nation, these brain injury centers on uh, some of the major bases. Uh, and it was for the purpose of uh, helping our returning service members who were diagnosed with this silent signature wound, and that is brain injury. And unfortunately, many times it's coupled with PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, which is a mental health uh, diagnosis where the traumatic brain injury is, um, is a physical diagnosis and uh, many times they had both. And, and so we would, we would work with uh, these service members and their families to give them new coping strategies. Uh, and my motto was, you'll never be the way you used to be, but you can be better than you ever have been. And uh, I, although I'm not on base and I'm not, I'm, pretty much retired from that. It was the most significant part of my career years. I came home at the end of the evenings, actually feeling like I might have made a difference in somebody's life. I think you've made a difference in a lot of people's lives. <laughs> and in <laughs> fact, um, you are uh, the founder of the Women's Leadership Foundation. And, mm -hmm. and could you share with us a little bit about what that organization, what their activities are? Yes, yes. I started that uh, for uh, the main purpose of, of helping women to understand their full potential, uh, to take on uh, the understanding of what personal leadership is all about. This is not uh, leadership in a, in a corporate environment. This is leadership in the home environment, in a personal environment. And um, we, uh, the mission really for the foundation was to help women in transition. That could be women, um, I worked a lot with abused women who had been put into shelters for protection purposes, who felt no sense of themselves. They felt no, they, they had nothing, they did not feel worthy of anything good in their life. And um, I had professionals be able to come in and help wardrobe them, help them with their hair and their makeup, help them with their psychological, giving them um, some counseling along the way, and then also career counseling so that they could re-enter the marketplace to have uh, re-establish their life. Many of them had children and they were the breadwinners for those children. And the reason that they were in the abusive relationship and not leaving was because they felt they couldn't maintain the, ch the the children without the help of, of the, that spouse who was actually um, causing um, a dangerous situation in the home environment. And uh, so it, it helped women in transition, also women who had been through uh, divorce or some traumatic um, occurrence in their life where their self-worth had declined so much that they were not competitive in the marketplace. They didn't know how to sell themselves. They didn't know how to go in and have a, a positive interview with a potential employer. And it was a, a, a great experience 
setting up a foundation 501c3 is a lot of work (laughs) unless you're ready to do it oh man be ready and have a lot of people ready to help you um uh, i'm not actively doing that now but i'm very happy that i had the experience and that i did it so i've worn a lot of different hats along the way you have worn a lot of hats and what i different titles the threads that i'm seeing is the smiles that you have put on people's faces, oh, whether like entertaining it. them or, or um, helping them, you know, uh, suffer through their challenges and yeah. put a smile on their face and their, and the women that you just talked about and dressing them. And it reminds me of a, a song on the Annie uh, soundtrack that says you're never fully dressed without a smile. And so, and I think that, I think that there's someone in your life, talk about full circle, military, someone has put a smile on your face in the, in that not so distant past. And that looks like he's continuing to tell us that story because it's a good one. Well, (laughs) it is a good one. And being at Camp Lejeune had a lot to do with the start of this story, um, but it started really at Ohio University. I was a part of what they called Angel Flight, uh, which was a support group for the Air Force ROTC at Ohio University, and I was a lieutenant colonel, and I wore a uniform, and, and I was very active uh, in that organization, and uh at one point, my senior year, I was at a uh, an awards at the at our college chapel, and it was an award for the ROTC cadets, and they were honoring a couple of them that had excelled as um, the cadets of the year and outstanding cadets and what have you, and they were presenting these awards and. Uh, I'm on one side of the chapel and the cadets were on the other side. And one cadet caught my eye and it was kind of like a Hallmark movie where everybody else kind of blurred out and we were just (laughs) one-on-one with each other, just noticing each other. And it was just for a moment, it was just a moment's gaze between us. Uh, And that was it. Uh, the young cadet that had caught my eye and he had seen me and uh, he turned to one of his uh, brothers and said, who is that? (laughs) And said, oh, that's Lori Schaefer. And, uh, and he said, oh, but she's involved, you know, forget her. (laughs) forget her she's involved I really wasn't but we were getting ready to graduate so that you know we didn't have time to go have a coffee or hamburger that was it 43 years later uh it was March of 2014. Now, March is a significant month because it's Brain Injury Awareness Month, by the way. Uh, Please, everyone watching, know what a concussion, the signs of concussion, and help children understand if they get hit, if their head is injured in any way, if they take a fall, or this is good for older people too to know, um, know the signs of a concussion. It's very important, uh, but oh, that's another subject. Anyway, going back to this uh, important person that I had this gaze with, uh, there was this letter on my desk, but I've been away doing all these events for Brain Injury Awareness Month. When I finally did open it up, it was from this gentleman in Washington state, uh, telling me I was a ROTC Air Force cadet senior year. I remember you. I don't know if you remember me. Uh, Never mentioned that he was the one that we had this gaze between. Just kind of reintroduced himself. He was a widower and uh, had a, a nice long uh, marriage, 38 year uh, marriage. And uh, his wife had passed uh, 
a, a year or so ago, and he was kind of just reaching out to people he remembered from Ohio University and sent me this letter. And the letter kind of sat on my desk for a while because I was really busy. <laughs> and, uh, and after a, a, a week or so, my, um, my boss came to me and she said, I got this email from a guy in Washington saying, did, did you get this letter? And, and does Laurel remember me? And so I guess I better contact him and say, no, I don't remember you. <laughs> <laughs> and so I, I did. And I, uh, I sent an, an email and just kind of got a, a dialogue going, a conversation, right. email, right. email only. Uh, I wasn't really even doing texting at that point, just an email. And uh, we, we kind of just getting to know each other. And he, he had a lot of really interesting things to share with me. And I I started to feel we had so much in common. I, 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 he intrigued me. And I, I have to back up and say, for 43 years, I every night when I say my prayers, I had said, you know, Lord, if you could just send me the right kind of man, I sure would like to find a man. I wanted to be married. And, <laughs> uh, but I, I didn't go out. I didn't do the bar scene, you know, I said, but he's going to have to just show up at my front door because I, I don't have any way to meet anybody. <laughs> and I kept that prayer going for a long time. And something came to me in a prayer, in, 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 in a dream uh, that I won't go into the, the whole story, but it was an indicator to me that that letter was very important that it was a key, that it was a lifeboat for me, that it was an answer to prayer. And so um, I became more interested in knowing more about this gentleman. And as time went on, uh, we started now uh, getting to the point where we wanted to talk on the phone. About three months after doing the email stuff, we started talking on the phone. And when I say talking on the phone, I mean three, four, or five times a week for three, four, or five hours at a time. Oh, my. <laughs> you were <And>, dedicated. <laughs> uh, and and, it, and as we know, most men don't want to talk that long, <laughs> you know, give him 20 minutes. And that's really remarkable. Uh, but he, he and I had so much to share and we shared everything. Uh, we shared experiences, we shared philosophies, we shared dreams about our future. And finally he said, you know, I think it's time to meet. So, um, finally by, uh, September of 2014, he flew from Washington to um, uh, North Carolina, and it was truly love at first sight. Uh, when he left, I thought, I, I met the man I want to marry. I, know, I don't know how he feels about me, but I know he's right for me. I had a deal breaker list of 10 items, and my friends used to say, there's no way that you're ever going to find somebody that's going to fulfill those 10 items, but maybe you can find somebody that has one or two of them. <laughs> I had checked off every single one. The last one was the wow factor. And Aww. when he got off the plane and walked to me and gave me that hug at the airport. Blown away. <laughs> Blown away, and you've been smiling. <laughs> and uh, he proposed. He took me back to Ohio University to the Galbraith Chapel. That uh, the December, uh, excuse me, Thanksgiving of 2014, and proposed. And May of 2015, we were married. So we're coming up on our seventh anniversary but the interesting part of this story is about october of 2014 i had another dream and the dream was that i was at a chapel at ohio university in my uniform and across the chapel was Michael in his uniform and we had this gaze between us. And I asked Michael, I, I, I text him. He was back in Washington at the time. And I said, did we have, did this happen to us? We're, did we actually have a connection, eye to eye connection back at, as seniors? And 
he didn't respond right away, but eventually we were talking that night and he said, yes, that actually happened, but I wanted to be the one to tell you. <laughs> so, <laughs> I love it. It, it came to it. me. It, I really felt it was a, a supernatural occurrence that was an affirmation and a confirmation that both of us had found each other at the right time of our lives. It was just everything came together and I had, had so different wonderful. titles, but I'll tell you the best title of all is MRS. <laughs> I love it. Well, I think you've put so many smiles on people's faces. I, I, I feel like he's, he's your reward for all of that. And you had lots to do before, before you met him. So, yes. so God, God bless the rest of the world with that time. And uh, now, now he's blessing you with, with Michael. So and we I don't live every day feeling that, Lorianne. That's a big, I'm that's so kind glad. of our personal motto is that every day is a gift and time is a gift. And we are so blessed. I, we okay. just, we, we, uh, we thank the Lord every single day day for the time that he's given us. We don't know how much time we'll have together, but every day that we have is a gift and we have so much fun. We just laugh. I can only imagine. <laughs> I think we might have just a few seconds for a question or so. I don't know if we have any, um, but I'm going to see what Whitney has for yeah. us. That'd be fun. Yeah. We do. We do have a question. I just want to fit this in. Okay. So, um, it says, dear, hi, Laurel Lee. I moved to Plymouth Avenue 21 years ago, currently live two houses down from your childhood home. Your mom and sister were so wonderful to my family and love telling us about your reign as Miss America. I have an amazing memory of being in your playground, in your backyard, under a playground structure. And to my surprise, there was a memoriam metal vase cup engraved for Miss America attached to the playground structure. Was there a good story of how it got there? I don't have any knowledge <laughs> of this. Uh, is this a um, playground? It would, uh, but not on Plymouth Avenue. Is it at Bexley? Um, it was in your, yeah, it was in your backyard under a playground structure. Well, a playground structure in your old backyard. Well, yeah. okay. Here is the interesting thing. A backyard of, of Plymouth Avenue. Uh, my dad had um, brought in a little playhouse it was built by an actual house builder it had electricity it had windows that opened it had dutch doors and i believe the new owners at plymouth avenue had it demolished or and maybe out of respect for the littlest museum on plymouth avenue they put a little uh, memorial plaque i don't but what was back there that little playhouse which wasn't so little actually it was actually a very cool place was the scene for tea parties when i was little and backyard plays to raise money for care and and i'd get everybody in the neighborhood involved and of course i produced it and of course i starred in everything we did. <laughs> and but we raised i think the last time that we had one we raised something like 87 dollars how do you raise that with a backyard play this would have been like in uh, 1958 you know i mean what uh and but that backyard was uh, uh, the place of many activities. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love I it. Love it. <laughs> um, there, there's someone else who remembers you performing in various events as a duo with Leslie. She says, I, oh, this is from oh. class of 70. I recall my freshman year having you her, hearing you sing at the GAC meeting. I believe you were called Laura and Leslie. She accompanied you on guitar and you harmonized beautifully. Oh, what a blast from the yeah. past. Yeah, I was, uh, 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 Leslie was from um, Eastmore and we had done, uh, we, we, we had, we were theater people. We had done stadium theater at Ohio State University, Bye Bye Birdie. And, um, and we just hit it off and she, ha she had the most amazing voice. She was really like a Barbara Streisand. She had a great voice, but she could play the guitar and harmonize. And so we started doing that. And then we had, um, 
uh, there was a band, uh, um, Ted Smith, uh, who was in my class, 67, and a, a group of, of fellows uh, had a band. And then we were the singers for the band, the Stoics. And uh, that was Bexley High School. But, the, oh, she, amazing talent, that, that woman. And she actually uh, went to... Um, to Hollywood and was a, she, she, I'm gonna get this wrong. I'm not sure what her title was. I know she did a lot of producing, but she was involved with um, a really cute show called ALF. And uh, she had a real major part, uh, you know, like in the producing production side of that show. So she was, she did great with her career. And she was also very well known in Columbus because she had um, a children's show and she did a lot of singing on that children's show. Yeah, yeah. Oh, very interesting. Well, you know, sadly, I think we're out of time, but thank you so much for um, coming and speaking. I'm so glad that we fit this in in March with International Women's Day, with National Brain Injury Awareness Month. Yeah, yes. Um, with, with March being such a, a special month for you. So uh, it is. And yeah. thank you so much for recognizing the, this 50 year anniversary. Anniversaries are important to celebrate. And I, and it means the world to me that it was my hometown that helped me to celebrate. Oh, it's so sweet. Okay. Well, you know, I am always amazed with the, the, the talent that grows in Bexley and then we send it out into the wind and it and it and it goes wonderful places and our Bexley our Bexley library is so full of talented people that love to help us celebrate all things Bexley and they are such a warm wonderful crew of people so it's not surprising that they decided that we should celebrate you so thank you thank you Thank you. You were forever in our hearts. So please, <laughs> as is Bexley. In my opinion. All right. Yeah. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.